slideshow. Yes, Good. Great. Right. Well, first of all, <clears throat> uh, it, I am very honored to be asked to make this presentation. Uh, I can only pray you will not feel uh, too disappointed. I want to apologize to your, our friends and colleagues in China who have had to get up so early in the morning. Please, uh, I would say, Debu uh, Chi. So we'll, we'll start off with uh, the main talk uh, straight away because all talk should be over as quickly as possible, but not too quickly. So here is Griffith John, who was an, an amazing uh, personality, an amazing character. <clears throat> he was a, a natural born uh, speaker. When he was 14 years of age, as a boy from school, being a devout Christian, he was able to command large crowds to hear him preach because of his eloquence and of his, his uh, fervor for his uh, way of life. But always in his heart of hearts, he knew he wanted to become, go to China, especially central China, in order to become, get to know the Chinese people and offer what help he could in those days in the middle of the 19th century. He was, he really had charisma. <clears throat> I'm showing you a map which was slightly uh, not the time when he arrived there, but it's there for a good reason. One is to because Han Ko and Han Yang and Wu Chang were very much more separate cities at the time. But I want to show you uh, uh, along the Yangtze River these important places which were uh, like sub embassies, but they were called concessions. The British one is there, the Russian, French, German, and Japanese. This is important because of the next picture. The next picture shows two very, imp two very important people, the one at the beginning and the one at the end. The one at the beginning is Dr. Reed from the British embassy there. He, he got to know Griffith John, and he said, I see you have built a good church. I see you have built a good school for education. Why haven't you built a hospital? This was about 1860 or so. Griffith John thought about that, and he, he agreed and started fundraising locally and through all his contacts in Britain. So there was a gap period where various doctors came and spent a varying time from two and a half to four years. But there were some remarkable people who came and went until the stage when Griffith John wanted to have a permanent appointment. And as you can see at the bottom, my grandfather, Tom Gillison, <clears throat> was able to, he arrived at 1893 studied Chinese very, very carefully for six months, and then he was a permanent member of the staff. <clears throat> there is a picture of my grandfather, and all the family says he is much more good-looking than me. <laughs> Along, alongside him soon came several other doctors, because the word had got about that a new hospital was being built. It was a very small, modest hospital. It had 25 male beds, 25 female beds, but at least it was the nucleus of, uh, of a hospital which was going to grow and grow. <clears throat> this lady was a remarkable lady, a gynecologist and an obstetrician, but she also performed a very important social service. As you remember, in the middle of China, there was a lot of poverty. And if a family was very desperate for funds to survive, particularly, shall we say, if the, the, the man of the family, who was the main wage earner, had an accident or died, there was a great risk if there was a young girl in the family 
of that girl being driven into prostitution. Margaret Biles realized this was happening because she found young girls of school age waiting at the front step of the hospital, having run away from the family and from the brothel keeper. And Margaret Biles had a special communication with a mission in Shanghai who had a building like a, <clears throat> a college building where these girls who were running away from prostitution were able to be fed and housed and educated and leave in order to earn uh, uh, their own living. And this was a huge benefit in those frightening days. There were some <clears throat> more and more people who joined um, uh, my, my grandfather, <clears throat> Fran's grandfather, and the one on the right, the picture is not so good, but he was a very intellectual man uh, called Percy McCall. <clears throat> and he was very keen to train young students in Wuhan to become doctors. <clears throat> I have to put the lady in the picture because she is a very special person. She is our grandmother. And she was a lovely lady who uh, was a very good linguist. She spoke French and German fluently, uh, and, but she herself uh, was very keen to come to China. And on the voyage coming to England about 1892, also, she met my grandfather and fell in love with him. And otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. Now, <clears throat> for all of you who from Tongji, from the Wuhan Union Hospital uh, Medical Center, I think you can be very proud because your medical school started as long ago as 1902. That was the time when Percy McCall and my grandfather and other staff decided to form a medical school to t train young Chinese doctors and spread across uh, the rest of China. <clears throat> and I think it was a very enlightened manifesto, which uh, surprised me and I was proud of it. It was a four year systemic teaching, two years in the wards. The teaching was to be in the Chinese language so all foreigners, like ourselves, had to learn Chinese, <clears throat> rightly so. Students who were Christians ought, got uh, admission quite easily, but I was delighted to see <clears throat> that Chinese students of good character, even if they were non-Christian, could be and were admitted. I thought this was remarkably good for a, a, some time, which is more than 150 years ago. And finally, now to link with other doctors in Wuhan and enlarge the medical school. So this was a very good start. From the headquarters in London, the London Missionary Society, they wanted to expand and enlarge a, a, a sort of demonstration uh, <clears throat> medical school and university at Jinan. It was spelt Sinan, but it's Jinan nowadays. So Dr. McCall and my grandfather had to go to Jinan for five years to help uh, the medical school to enlarge and grow. Both of them were invited to stay at the <clears throat> end of their time after five years in 1919. But my grandfather, our grandfather, had specially come to work with Griffith John, and he gave his he, he gave his heart to live and work in Wuhan. So he declined the invitation to stay at Jinan. <clears throat> this was an exciting time because the Nursing Association of China, <clears throat> it was founded in 1909. And the lady in white was an American woman, <clears throat> and she was called Cora Simpson, and she was the first president. And freshly arrived from London, <clears throat> I have to remind Dr. Deng, it was the London Hospital and not St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Um, this lady, this uh, 
qualified nurse, she became the first matron of the nursing school of Wuhan Union Hospital. So nursing had taken off very well at this stage. And my father said all his life, <clears throat> the best nurses in the world are the Chinese nurses. <clears throat> Forgive me if I indulge in a little bit of history of China. This is a, an artist's map, which was taken from the drawing from my grandfather's letter to my uncle Walford, who was a schoolboy in Edinburgh. And he described the battle and he, on his drawing, an artistic friend of mine has produced this uh, image. And if you look at the situation, <clears throat> the, the Union Hospital was right at the middle and the center of the revolution of, <clears throat> of, of the people in China who did not want to be under the rule of the Qing emperors. These were the revolutions. And it all started on the double 10th, that's October the 10th, 1919, and it all started here. The rev the, there was a big fight at the revolutionary fort in Wuchang, spread down the river, and also spread across the river <clears throat> in Hanyang uh, as another station. Meanwhile, the imperial troops uh, came down by railway to Station A, Station B, Station C, three stations, and they formed a, a battle line against the revolutionaries. And my grandfather was right in there, in the Union Hospital, and the medical students, there were about 10 medical students, only about 60 beds, and the battle lasted for three days. <clears throat> there were uh, over a thousand people killed, many hundreds were injured, and the other hospitals, there were four other hospitals in Hanko, but the Union Hospital admitted 200 patients in three days. And I was very proud of the way the staff at the hospital behaved. They cleared the furniture out of the church. They therefore made the church uh, building like a triage center, which is often done in uh, major disasters. And then those that could be rescued and operated on or nursed were moved into the 60 beds or to private houses on the premises. And so for three days, this battle went on until the revolutionaries uh, retreated. But of course, that was only the beginning. Dr. Sun yat -sen arrived. And of course, you know the story better than me, how eventually the emperors uh, of, of China became obsolete. So I thought all of you from the Union, Sheho Iren, the Union Hospital, would be proud of the fact that right at the beginning of the revolution, Union Hospital was in the middle of the battlefield. I'm proud of it, and I'm sure you are too. There was, with only 60 beds <clears throat> during that revolutionary war, it was ridiculous. There was a great need for a modern hospital for those times. So throughout China, and throughout <clears throat> Britain, and Canada, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, there were requests for money to build a, a new hospital. And sure enough, in 1928, <clears throat> the Union Hospital was built. Now, it was called Union for two reasons. Before, no, pa male patients were always in a separate building from female patients by tradition. And therefore, you had two matrons, you had two senior doctors, you had two double staff, and they needed, you had to uh, <clears throat> make it more economical. So it was a union of the gender, male and female, and it was a union between the Methodist Medical so the Med uh, Society, which, of which the doctors got on very well with the, uh, the, the union hospital doctors. So it was a union in two senses of the word. So at that year happened to be when my grandfather <clears throat> uh, not only graduated from uh, Edinburgh University as a doctor, but he wanted to be a surgeon and he trained to do that. <clears throat> and because he was available to take part, 
it meant that my grandfather, our grandfather, <clears throat> Tom, Tom Gillison, with the help of a scholar, a Mandarin scholar, very fine man, called Chao Shifun, and the two of them translated two major books, which were known in, in medicine. One was a chemistry book, and the other book, which I think you can see that huge book on the, on the table, is Cunningham's Anatomy, which basically has the histology, embryology, and anatomy of the human body. So they translated that. <clears throat> and I always do admire the Chinese uh, medical profession because you ha your medical terms are so much more poetic than our Br British ones. For I asked my father, I said, what is the uh, Chinese for an artery? And he said it was dongme, which of course means throbbing pulse. And I said, what is the Chinese for a vein? And he said, jinme, silent pulse. I think the Chinese medical terms are much more poetic and much more realistic than the Latinized uh, British uh, uh, <laughs> terminology. So that was, and I know that my, my grandfather and uh, Zhao Chi Sun were responsible. So the staff expanded, but very quickly to go through the names, suddenly an experienced physician called Chapman turned up. He was a bit formal and a bit stiff, but he did smile occasionally. There's the young man is my father, our father. And in the middle is George Haddon, a, a very colorful Irishman. And he was the founder of the IHT, the in, in International Hospital Technology Department. More about the later. This is young Dr. Wong, one of the earliest house surgeons who's graduated. I don't remember this lady's name. This is Kundal, who was a, a famous, <clears throat> famous uh, stopgap. Uh, but Andrew Hicks has uh, sent me a picture showing Dr. Kundal in his uh, in comments on that. He was a very useful general thing, a very strong sense of humor. This was a bit of a dragon. She was called Gladys Stevenson, but she really was very, a very nice lady and very, uh, very high standards. And this is Dr. Chow, who uh, was um, a, a budding physician uh, and later became a, a senior, senior doctor in the hospital. But things were beginning to expand fast. Now I'll introduce you to this terrible time. In 1931, the banks of the river Yangtze broke in Hanko, and of course there was flooding all over the, the <clears throat> basin of China. And as somebody has mentioned already, there were 200,000 square kilometers of flood all, all the way from Yichang down to, towards Shanghai. It's the area is the same as the British Isles. And, <clears throat> and the, the, this flooding was quite frightening. It was very quick. On 31st of May, my father was eating his breakfast and he was just feeling that his feet were suddenly very cold. And he looked down and he found that the water from the river Yangtze was pouring in to the hospital. So he made sure my mother was quickly moved upstairs. He went to the hospital and the last 30 uh, meters, he had to swim because the river was rising so high. And at that stage, it rose, um, it, uh, it rose five um, meters up the wall of the hospital. So by the time he climbed onto the first floor, all the nurses had got all the patients from the ground floor safely up to the first floor and they were uh, had everything running as as it, as it should be but of course this was a major disaster sadly the river kept rising and where you see the dotted line in that picture is the uh, what's left of what was the old woman's hospital and you can see some white walls which are just the outer edge that had completely uh, been destroyed apart from that wall. This is where the relic of the men's hospital, which was a separate building. They were still keeping patients there. 
before moving them all over to the Union Hospital. And note that these, uh, how rough the water was and these wooden bars there. And of course, when the wind blew and the water bashed against the wall, it was very, very dangerous. <clears throat> so the <clears throat> colleagues down in Shanghai sent up an old cargo boat and provided it, the, sat, the SS Hannah Moller, as a ward. So all the patients were put in there for a start. But the trouble was the nurses got seasick, the patients got seasick, and it really was uh, not uh, quite ideal. So therefore other premises had to be found for the patients. The women patients went to an empty um, blind school in a high bit of ground in Hankou. But <clears throat> in Hanyang, there was some high land and therefore the hospital uh, <clears throat> engineers with matting and poles provided what was called the mat hospital. And they were able to make an operating theater and they were able to make a, a nursery and so on. And it was wonderful what they did. The only problem was they were surrounded by 100,000 uh, refugees, 40,000 were from Hanko and the other 60,000 from Shaogan and all, all, all around. And there were problems with, uh, with having enough toilet facilities with 100,000 people all above water and it was a real battle. But the battle was won and they were so glad that they built the new Union Hospital because it had been made so well that uh, they, the, it could be used straight away. But many people from all over China and the world had contributed. And I'm very proud of our grandmother who had a house in her own name in Edinburgh in Scotland. She sold the house and gave all the money for the fund in order to have the best possible quality uh, building to play with. But she was not the only one. There were many other generous donors. <clears throat> so <clears throat> all sorts of good things happened from the when the flood was over. Medicine and surgery became separate disciplines. <clears throat> this Institute of Hospital Technology was brilliant because they took, they took responsibility for anesthesia, radiology, pharmacy, and so on, and the limb fitting, uh, all as one department then. And it was so successful that I remember seeing an article in the China Medical Journal of how this should be the pattern for all hospitals in China because of the way it helped the administration. Clinical conferences were, were combined and when the, the, <clears throat> the river water had drained, of course, it was so wet, it was a wonderful, uh, feeding ground for mosquitoes, so they had to drain the ground and get mosquito netting on every window and every door in order to reduce the chances of malaria. <clears throat> they also instituted private wards. <clears throat> this was quite a brave thing to do because the great Griffith John did not approve of private medicine at all. He said it should all be done uh, on a proper pay-for-service basis, but Griffith John had gone back to the UK in retirement and so they were able to get a private ward because with the money from the better off patients, they were able to pay for the patients who had no money at all. And that fund from the private ward was called the Samaritan Fund, a very good system. One of the many sad things <clears throat> which uh, was a big problem in the 30s was the amount of opium dens. <clears throat> My mother recorded that there were 54 registered opium dens in Hanko alone. They were a bit like pubs, except that a lot of the customers never came out and of course caused tremendous poverty around. Opium addiction was at one time in 1934, the largest cause of hospital admissions not just at the uh, Union Hospital, but uh, in all the hospitals in Wuhan. And chloroform anesthesia was established and, and, and well run. <clears throat> Dr. Ch uh, Dr. Chang was the head of the anesthetic department. But of course, it costs money to have a general anesthetic 
especially in hot weather in those days. So the <clears throat> spinal anesthetic, the thesia was encouraged, which of course was brilliant, uh, and layered local anesthesia as well. Now you may be surprised at seeing this word layered local anesthesia, but I, all I can say when, when I was a consultant surgeon in, uh, in Worcestershire, I once had a patient who was a heavy smoker, 50 years of age. My anesthetist refused to anesthetize him. He said he would not survive the, the anesthetic on the table. So I telephoned my father who was about 200 miles away. And I said, tell me how you dealt with this in Wuhan. And he said, you estimate the amount of lignocaine, make it up to 100 mils of uh, saline, put one third into the, uh, to infiltrate the skin, one third to the rectus sheath, and the last third to put into the peritoneum. And if you do that, then you can do a gastrectomy or anything. The patient had a burst duodenal ulcer, and with two silk stitches, I could close the hole, wash out the abdomen, and uh, come out, uh, with, and the patient had very little pain. So what happened in 1940 in Wuhan, I was able to translate into Birmingham in 1980. So I'm very grateful to Wuhan for uh, allowing me to operate on that man with the ulcer. Finally, before the, the world, Second World War, Dr. Kung introduced the, introduced the no-touch technique and the, there was a dramatic reduction in, in wound infection. There were some quite exciting operations going on. My grandfather introduced tarsorophy and he basically infiltrated local anesthesia to the tarsal plate, split it down the middle, turned it 90 degrees so the, head, the eyelash is no longer ulcerated the cornea. And that was a standard operation done by all the, the surgical departments. <clears throat> Fractured spine were a, a problem with uh, the need for traction. And on the whole, in, in, uh, in, at the Union Hospital, a plaster Paris jacket was put on. The patient was placed in the supine position as trying to arch the back as much as possible. And this stabilized the fracture very well. Artificial pneumothorax for tuberculosis was uh, tried at certain times to collapse the lung, collapse the tuberculous cavity, and hope that uh, nature would get better. <clears throat> um, my uncle Gordon was briefly working out as a doctor there. Unfortunately, he had diabetes, and he himself caught tuberculosis and had to return back to the UK <clears throat> uh, uh, fairly soon afterwards. But he introduced the technique, and uh, it, it was useful until, of course, anti-tuberculous drugs came. The IHT, or, or the, uh, the department, uh, produced some superb upper and lower wind, wind, uh, limb prostheses. And at one time, there was a problem with compound fractures uh, of, of the arm. And I'll just show you a few patients on that score. A quick word on something which is thankfully obsolete. Lymphogranuloma venerium is an infection <clears throat> usually affecting men in the, in the inguinal nodes and in the penis and scrotum. And, uh, but in females, in women, it tended to affect the uh, anal canal and lower rectum, producing awful strictures. And these strictures meant that these poor women would have to sit for squat for hours to pass a certain amount of motion. And, I'm, and somebody, and I don't know who managed it, found that if you did a radical proctoctomy, you divided the posterior wall of the rectum and the full of the anal canal, it relieved the, uh, the partial obstruction, and there was no comment as far as I knew or record of incontinence afterwards. Presumably the edema around the infected area or was, um, was sufficient to keep them continent. Of course, doxycycline can be used now and that saves that operation. But that was a brilliant operation for a nasty condition. A 
brief word about, <clears throat> uh, about splints and uh, things. This is a famous thing called the aeroplane splint, which was uh, described elsewhere. <clears throat> but the IHT realized that it was far too expensive to buy. So they made this from galvanized iron. So you can see that at the lower end, the wings were strapped around the patient's body. The arm was therefore elevated on that side arm and that made a very comfortable dressing. The dressings could be inspected, changed, and they could be treated as outpatients and not <clears throat> having to occupy a hospital bed. Before, <clears throat> and this chap called Winnis Orr, an American surgeon from World War I, found that if they were infected, there were compound fractures, if they were irrigated with a little <clears throat> rubber tube and the pus was washed away, eventually <clears throat> the arm would heal, the bones would heal and the patient would be able to use his arm again. Before Witness Orr's treatment, which was carried out in, in, in <clears throat> at the Wuhan Union Hospital, um, the, you would have to amputate half of the patients. But with this Witness Orr treatment, with the aeroplane splint, I know I asked my father, all 11 soldiers did not require an amputation. So things were very exciting up in those days as they have been since. Along came the spectre of the Sino-Japanese War. <clears throat> and this is where a lot of uh, anguish and grief and poverty and, and death took place. Everyone who is a graduate from the Tongji Wuhan Union Hospital knows, unlike so many people in the world, the war between Japan and China was not eight years. It was 14 years. And as this <clears throat> map shows, the invasion of Korea took place, then the capture and uh, invasion of Man Manchuria, now called Manchukuo, took place. And of course, as your books, your own history books would show, there were battles all along the coastline until that famous horrendous battle of, in Shanghai in 1937 when the war began in earnest. <clears throat> so here you have the problem. Mao Zedong hated Jiang Kai-shek or Jiang Jieshi. Jiang Kai-shek hated Mao Zedong, but fortunately for the sake of China, the two um, agreed to be allies and fight the common enemy of Japan. And as you know, it was a long and bitter war which cost millions of lives. The <clears throat> Mao fought a very effective guerrilla type of war warfare against the Japanese in the northern half of China, and there were thousands of soldiers, guerrillas killed. Jiang, in, who settled in Chongqing, uh, probably, I, they estimated there were probably 20 million Air Force, Army, uh, <clears throat> soldiers and civilians who probably died during the whole of that conflict. It was a very long and bloody war, as all of you know. Here was Chang's main department. You remember the bloody battle in Shanghai was when it all began. Nanjing was the capital of China then. And I think you all know the story of the rape of, of Nanjing, which was a classic example of ethnic cleansing, where in six weeks, 300,000 Chinese people were raped or killed or both um, <clears throat> before the, uh, they, they moved on. It took uh, Japan until just after the, uh, the, the, the millennium to admit that it had been responsible for that war crime. <clears throat> the capital of uh, China moved to Wuhan for a short while, while while we were there, from what I can remember. But again, Chang never had enough aircraft to compete with the Japanese onslaught at that stage until later. So he moved west to Chongqing and formed the basis of the resistance against Japan. The Battle of Wuhan took place at the end of October uh, till the 1st of November and it was another bloody battle and uh, 
all the hospitals, including the Union Hospital, had a tremendous influx of casualties, but at least the bombing, which had been off beforehand, had stopped. Everything changed because my parents were there, a lot of uh, foreign missionaries and foreign business people were there, but on December the 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor took place. <clears throat> there were, I think, 2,400 uh, soldiers killed. 21 ships were sunk uh, with the onslaught. And as regards Hong Kong, <clears throat> war was, the bombing of Hong Kong occurred on the same day as Pearl Harbor. And uh, they invaded and captured Hong Kong <clears throat> after 4,500 uh, <clears throat> British and, Common and Empire soldiers were killed and 6,500 POWs. Uh, and about as many Japanese were killed. It was another terrible battle. And then Hong Kong became part of the Japanese empire. All of us who were now, since December the 7th, 1941, we were all enemies of Japan. So we all had to wear an armband. Uh, the Americans had an A on their armband, the British B, Canadian C, Dutch D, and so on. And that's what we had to wear all the time. They thought this would produce, the Japanese thought, a loss of face, but we were very proud of our armbands. So what was happening? Here was, as so soon as Pearl Harbor took place, the Japanese moved into the Union Hospital and said, we are going to take over the building from now onwards. You foreigners will be sent away to um, uh, imprisonment and the, the Chinese staff and Chinese patients will have to find other accommodation. <clears throat> Just before that stage, some of you may recognize the old gate. And if you look at the little office beyond the pers person in white, there was a little um, <clears throat> seat or stand where a Japanese guard took place. And very quickly, he learned to take 10% of the value of any goods going out through the front hospital gates. But all of us, foreign and Chinese, <clears throat> learned to throw the goods over the wall to the left of the gate, which the guard couldn't see in order to obey such extortion. So that was a very useful trick. But now when the <clears throat> what had happened then was all the, <clears throat> the foreigners, that Swedish, American, British, French, <clears throat> Uh, people working in Wuhan, not all missionaries, some not all doctors, all sorts of uh, professions. We all had to move to Shanghai for semi-imprisonment. And that was, funnily enough, on August the 14th, 1942, almost three years to the day to the end of the war. So that was quite a long time. What was happening back at the Union Hospital? This is the important thing. This is an empty <clears throat> uh, bank in downtown uh, Hanko, which was, which was empty. And so the hundred or so patients who the Japanese had thrown out because they commandeered the, the Union Hospital building to be uh, a fever hospital for all Japanese uh, personnel in central China. And what they did here was absolutely amazing. So here was an ad hoc, almost as primitive as the Matt Hospital, and it became the Ho Chi Hospital. Introduce you to people who um, are th three of the most, I think, remarkable contributors to the hospital. You may all re recognize Lucy Ye or Ye Hua Ying, her husband, on, on her left, he was a very, very competent cardiologist. And then Lucy, or Hui, Ye Hua Ying's father, <clears throat> uh, is, the, is the man on the left. And he was the man of action, one of the two men of action were in the Ho Chi Hospital. <clears throat> now, Ye Ke Cheng, that's Lucy's father, was officially in charge of the Ren Chi Hospital in Wu Chang. But uh, there was a Renchi outpatients department, and that became involved with the new makeshift Ho Chi Hospital. And the other is the man you can see in the YK Liu, 
I wish I could find a picture, but he was a remarkable man. All I know was that he was a bright senior resident in the Wuhan Hospital of the War. Uh, he became the head surgeon, and he was, I know he was trained in, uh, <clears throat> in Taiwan, I think that's all, but I don't know what happened to him afterwards. Anyway, he and Yerka Cheng <clears throat> very wisely appointed the mayor of Wuchang, who they knew was a sympathizer of the Japanese. Now that meant when the Japanese medical staff in the Union Hospital, which they had taken over, tried to muscle in to the Ho Chi Hospital, this mayor was able to say, no, this is a Chinese hospital, not a Japanese hospital, you go away. When there was any evidence of corruption, it was treated by instant dismissal. And you can imagine with the conditions there, they were able to continue the training for medical students to become doctors, the training for nurses to become qualified nurses. And in other words, life went on and they did a wonderful job. Those two people are two of my main heroes from in the history of, uh, of the Wuhan Hospital before <clears throat> before the uh, state took over in 1950. As you know, the war was going on. It was bitter. There was a lot of death. The Americans had lost 170,000 troops. The British and the uh, and Commonwealth, the same sort of number. We don't know how many Japanese were killed, but the Americans realized that if they reached the edge, they captured the Quilafines, they captured Iwo Jima, they captured um, other, other islands nearby, and they really felt that back home, there something drastic should be done, and of course, not knowing what a, an atom bomb was, they dropped the bomb in order to stop the war. The Japanese refused to capitulate, and as you know, about three or four days later, the Americans dropped another bomb on uh, Nagasaki, and after that bomb, <clears throat> then the, uh, ja the, the Japanese uh, military and the emperor surrendered. The terrible cost of Japanese lives, but there probably would have been as many, if not more, if the war had convention carried on much longer by convention. That's a, one can argue. So sure enough, on August the 15th, <clears throat> The, uh, all the military surrendered on SS Missouri in front of General MacArthur. And back on the mainland, Zhang Jiexi insisted there should be a ceremony uh, to be had in, the, uh, in there. And General Ho Ying Chen was of the Chinese army on the left, received the surrender document from Saburo Kabuhashi. Uh, on September the 9th. So at last the war was finally over. <clears throat> what was happening back in Wuhan? Well, it was a terrible struggle. They had to bring that, they had to bring the, the patients in the Ho Chi Hospital. They had to look for equipment and personnel from the Ren Chi and Ho Chi Hospitals. And when they got back to the, <clears throat> to the Union Hospital, they found the premises were filthy. There had been a lot of plundering of vital equipment. X-ray machines had gone, anesthetic machines, sterilizers, all sorts of things have gone. But um, Andrew, uh, in Andrew, Neal's, uh, Andrew Hicks's uh, email to me, I discovered that the, um, the working staff had hidden a lot of equipment in an attic somewhere, and they managed to find these and uh, get them back into use. And it's a lovely story, which I look forward to, to reading. Now, <clears throat> the other thing was that of the 200, 600 Japanese patients, there were 200 stranded and left behind. Several of them wanted to, they were so ashamed, they wanted to have Chinese nationality, but I think that had to be settled at a higher level. I think they had to go to Japan, they could come back later. <clears throat> the arrival of two very important functions were miraculous. The thing called the Friends Ambulance Unit, they drove trucks all over Free China and into China proper when the war was going the right way. 
and they had terrific experience in, in rough roads and producing food and equipment in an emergency basis. They were great, great. And along with them came UNRWA, which is the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. They were terrific. They, they came to the Union Hospital. They saw the, what the problem was with these neglected premises. So they said to all the medical staff, we will pay your salary for six months. We will pay for the running of the hospital and we will <clears throat> help you clean and clear out this. And they produced new x-ray machines, new <laughs> equipment, and they were, they were absolutely brilliant. And sure enough, uh, the regular staff who had been sent away were gradually able to come back. So there was another campaign for money and people started to come back. And this little certificate is my father's certificate. Please may I come back and work where I want to live because and work. And he was able to come back in 1947 and help, help with the surgical department. <clears throat> so you had this high, this gap between the war and, and all the, up, uh, the upheaval then and this very uneasy peace. And it was so sad that there was a loss, loss of public confidence in the Kuomintang uh, government. There was, they knew there was a lot of corruption and there was massive inflation. And my father said he remembers inflation was so bad that the nursing staff at the end of the month's salary were paid in notes which were carried in wheelbarrows because the actual paper money had lost from inflation. So it was no wonder. In 1949, there were some new faces. Here came a new leader, a new army, and new ideas, and really they were desperate to have for a change. And it was not surprising that Mao and, and the CCP took over the country so quickly. It was not difficult. Again, back at the Sheho Yuren, <clears throat> the Wuhan hospital, um, they, of course, appointed two parallel presidents. The man on the left, I don't know his name, but he was the political commissar. He was the one who organized indoctrination classes, and sometimes he would interrupt an operation list in order to get the, the Mao ideology uh, put across. And the nursing medical staff were very good. They did stop and... Uh, attend the classes and then carry on again. But it was a very difficult time when my father was there <clears throat> because my father spoke very good Chinese and <clears throat> at the time of the, of the uh, change of government, the proletariat, that is anybody could sue the hospital for whatever they felt was bad treatment. So my poor father, he spoke very good Chinese but people often uh, joke with him and say, Keith, your Chinese was very good, but you have a terrible Wuhan accent. But in spite of his terrible Wuhan accent, he was able to explain in court what happened in the hospital with each of the patient's complaints. So being the senior surgeon, some of the major cases had to wait until he got home from court at the end of each day and then he would start operating at nine o'clock at night uh, until the list was over. So it was quite physically tiring for him. But there was some wonderful Chinese staff around. One of the great problems was <clears throat> on the 15th, on the 25th of, of June, 1950, the Korean War began. And one of the best surgeons that my father had ever worked with called Paul Chang, was asked to take part in a strike against the hospital's management because the hospital was imperialist and foreign. And he refused. <clears throat> so Paul Chang was, uh, was sent to uh, North Korea to support, and no doubt he did very fine work there, but he never came back to Wuhan again. <clears throat> and they fear that he was probably killed out, <clears throat> out there in the Korean War. But the spirit of the hospital remained. Patients were cared for very, very well in spite of the difficult situation. We have a, an expression 
in English, because oak trees can be 20 or 30 or more meters high, but of course the acorn or the seed is only two centimeters. And there's a very true saying, tall oaks from little acorns grow. And this is the tall oak that has grown from the little place you saw earlier on. And we're, we're, I have had the privilege to go back to Wuhan for, on four occasions. And I just wish my father and my grandfather could see it. They would be so thrilled with the progress that has been made. <clears throat> I have spoke to a lady in the, in the administrative department, and she said that the main campus is nearly 3,000. I think it's in Hanyang campus. I've been there once. It's about 900. The cancer hospital has 600 beds. And after a <clears throat> the Jin Yin Hu Hospital is included. I think the uh, Tongji Medical and <clears throat> Wuhan Union Hospital will probably have clinical responsibility for 5,000 beds. It is a, a wonderful achievement, and it is, it, it is so good to see after all the strife over the years. Thank you for your attention. Bugandong.